Let's open our Bibles to the first chapter of the Gospel by John. That's the fourth Gospel, the Gospel by John. It's not the Gospel of John. It wasn't his idea. It's by him. He's just writing down the Gospel that God gave him, and he's the one that recorded it. The Gospel by John, chapter 1, and in just a few moments, we're going to be starting in verse 1. But the question we need to consider is what standard do we use to measure whether or not we're properly handling the Word of God? Uh, there, there is much debate about whether or not the Bible should even be introduced in society, and even in the church, a lot of people are downplaying the authority of the Bible because they say, well, you can't really be sure. Well, how do we know that we're properly handling the Bible? And when the criticisms come, that oh, wait a minute, that's just your view, how do we answer that? Well, the scriptures tell us the answer is this. Whenever we use the Bible, one standard we should always seek to gauge that we're doing so correctly is the standard of how Jesus used the scriptures. So think of this. The standard is Jesus Christ and the implications. I want you to think of that word, the implications of Christ's convictions about the Word of God. If you really embrace Christ's convictions about the Bible, it has strong implications on how you present the Bible to our culture because it would, it would be fitting that, that we would present it with the same authority that he did because it's not our authority, it's his because it's his Word, as we'll see in John 1. So this morning... In John 1, starting in verse 1, we need to consider the implications of Christ's conviction because Jesus had the highest view of Scripture. Now, you know, that's something that's talked about. Uh, Jesus flatly stated he was God who came to earth as God the Son. He goes on to say that he was the exact representation of God the Father in human flesh. That's down in verse 18. And that the Bible, or the Scriptures as he called them, were to be understood as the very words that God spoke. Yes, by John, by Luke, by Mark, by Matthew, by Paul, by Peter, by James, by all the the galaxy of Old Testament prophets, but they were the very words of God. And Christ's convictions about the Bible are the highest that are possible to be held. Now, a lot of... uh, measuring sticks nowadays are are used about whether or not a church or a certain uh, servant of God or pastor has a high view of scripture or a low view. Now that, you know, even that doesn't sound very good, does it? Do you have a high view or a low view of scripture? The high view of scripture are the ones that believe it's inerrant, that it's inspired, that it's infallible, that it's God-breathed, that it is authoritative, uh, that, that in all parts of, of history and science and as well as morals and theology, that it's all God's very mind revealed to us. Now, a low view of Scripture is that you kind of pick and choose, you know, and you say, ooh, not too sure about that Genesis stuff and some of those miracles and, you know, and the fish swallowing the man. I'm not sure about that, you know. That's called a low view of Scripture. Now, now people, I mean, they don't put that on the signs. You can't drive around Kalamazoo and uh, we hold a low view of Scripture, you know, uh, and the other church, we have a high view of Scripture. That is not normally done. But what you do is if you listen for a while, to them on television, to them on the radio, or to them speaking, or however you, or read what they do. Look at whether they have a high view, low view. Jesus had a high view of scriptures. And Jesus explains to us, starting in verse 1, who he is and what he has revealed to us in his word. In the beginning, John 1, 1, was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then down to verse 12. But as many as received Him, that's this Word that that came into this world, to them He gave the right to become children of God. To those who who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred above me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the declaration of God. That you are the, as the word in the original text says, you are the exegeo, you're the exegesis, you are the explanation. You show us and reveal to us God the Father because you are the exact representation of God. Oh, thank you for revealing to us that our God is loving and compassionate, full of grace and truth, full of mercy and love. And I pray that we will have a high view of his word, for it's your word, for you are the living word come down to man. And you have recorded for us in this book your word. And I pray that the implications of how you gave us this word, how you use this word, and your convictions based on this word would impact us this morning. Open our eyes, our hearts, our minds. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This Bible is God's word. As I've said probably in every message of this series, this is the book that Jesus used and trusted and believed and memorized. It's the the word that he was, that he spoke, that he left for us. And this, this word we must seriously consider. Not just the fact that Jesus believed it was reliable scientifically and he believed it was reliable historically and he believed it was reliable prophetically. But the implications of what that means to our culture. You know, we've just been kind of looking at at the facts that Jesus believed that the record of the Bible was exactly correct. Now this morning, it might get a little uncomfortable because we have to take a step forward. So Jesus believed that the history of the Bible is true. Does that mean anything about today? So Jesus believed that the, the account of the origin of the universe was exactly true as it's written in the Bible. What does that mean about our culture, our world, our education system, et cetera, et cetera? That's what we have to look at. So starting back in the book of Matthew, I would like to take you to Matthew 19. And I want to, first of all, talk with you about the implications of Christ's view of the scientific record. Uh, remember, shio, science, comes from the Latin word shio, and it means to know. And so science is the study of the world around us, what we know from the study of the world around us, the observations that have been made and, the, and, and what we can deduce from those observations and, and verify. So in Matthew, we look at a time when Jesus was asked to explain God's standards on marriage. So where does he go? He goes back to Genesis. He goes back to creation. He goes back to the beginning, as he called it. So I want you this morning to consider the implications of Christ's convictions. Because he had a high view of Scripture. Because Jesus had actually the highest view that you can have of Scripture. Because he says, I am the Word. I am the Word of God. He said, I I breathed out through the prophets. It's the Spirit of Christ breathing out through them. Because of that... As we open to Matthew 19 and starting in verse 4, we look at the implications of Christ's convictions that the Bible contained trustworthy, reliable science. In Matthew 19, when Jesus described the beginning, he talks about the very first humans who are named in that passage in Genesis. And we'll see him quoting that passage that describes those first two human beings as Adam and Eve. In fact, Jesus actually In his question, he doesn't just give a synopsis. He quotes from Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 5. And he actually says, I believe this so much that I'm going to give you the words that are written down. And I believe this, and I affirm this. And so 
He says, everything starts with the creation account. So Matthew 19, verse 4. He answered and he said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? That's a quote of Genesis 1, 27 and 5, 2. Now look at verse 5 of Matthew 19. And he said... And here's another quotation. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Quoting Genesis 2.24. So Jesus, now for those of you that are into all this, Jesus quotes from the Genesis 1 account, the Genesis 2 account, and he says they're both true, and then he quotes from Genesis 5. So he says this whole unit from 1 through 5, I, I verify I kind of put my stamp, my seal on it, that it's true, it's accurate. Now, what was happening? Well, if you read the whole passage in Matthew 19, Jesus was confronted with skeptics, and they had questions designed to trap and trip up Jesus. So what did he do? Jesus affirmed Genesis chapters 1 through 5. He said this is a true scientific record of origins. These are the chapters that contain the creation account. And since Jesus also... After this section I just read to you, starting in verse 7, also affirmed the Moses chapters. Jesus also affirmed the law, the Ten Commandments, and all that Moses wrote. And in that, remember we already looked at the Ten Commandments, and the commandment about the Sabbath day says this, and I quote, For as the Lord created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested the seventh, so you... Israelite Jews living in your tents with all your animals should work six days and rest the seventh. Now in any usage of language, when you have a group of people and you make a comparison and you say, as I did this, you should do that. As I did something in six days and rested the seventh, you should do something in six days and rest the seventh. Just the laws of communication when you're talking about 600,000 families listening to this would be that God told them that the six days they work and their work week and rest the Sabbath is the same schedule he used to make the whole universe. I mean, that's the simplest and the most proper understanding of Exodus 20, which is a statement of the creation account. So, Jesus affirmed the literal six-day nature of the creation account. Now, we've already gone through this. I'm not going to belabor it. But that means that salvation from Adam's sin that has affected all humans, that Adam's sin plunged the entire universe under the decaying power of sin. So you can't understand the universe and what's going on out there and what is being observed if you don't understand why everything is going, winding down to this ultimate, what they call, heat death. Everything is winding down, and and it's all decaying and, and coming down to cooling down, slowing down, and going to an end. The whole universe, it's just, I mean, they even talk about, you know, when our sun is going to finally just shrink down and become a little nothing, and, and it will stop radiating out heat and light. And that concept is not understood unless we understand what it says in Romans 5 through 8. Jesus said that because of Adam's sin, the whole universe is groaning and decaying. Jesus believed and affirmed that. Okay, so that's just the facts. We stopped there last time, a few weeks ago. What are the implications of Christ's view of science? Jesus believed in a literal six-day creation account, that God made everything from nothing, that he formed it, that he that He unfurled it and rolled out this universe and he set it in motion it was perfect and because of the sin of the first man death passed and creation groans under the bondage of that sin what are the implications of that well all museums all textbooks all teachers and every school that proclaims as science something different from god's word jesus would say they're wrong did you catch that all museums every textbook every teacher, in any school that would proclaim as science something different from the observations God recorded and defined for us 
are wrong. That means any science that contradicts the truth that God created the universe perfectly and that the sin of the first human plunged all of humanity and the universe into a vortex of destruction is also denying God the creator. So, what does that mean? Well, keep going to the other end of the Bible. Look at 2 Peter with me. 2 Peter is a little book parked just before Revelation, just about eight books before Revelation. So, go through the Gospels and Romans, Corinthians, the little epistles, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd, Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, there it is, 1st Peter, and go to 2nd Peter chapter 3. And if you can't get it that way, go Revelation through John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and back up that way. But look at, at with me at 2nd Peter 3, starting in verse 5. Because when Peter says that the same God who spoke everything into being is going to stop everything, That's truth we can live by. See, we have the historic record from the beginning to the ending. We we have it. You're holding it this morning. If you have a copy of the Bible, if you don't have a copy, there's one in the racks in front of you, and they're a gift from a man in our church who bought them that anybody that doesn't have a Bible can take one home with them. I mean, if you like yours so much, write in it and take it with you, okay? It's, don't take the hymn book, though. Just take the Bible. We need the hymn book here. But 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 5. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Verse 6, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. That's an affirmation of the Noahic global deluge or flood. Verse 7, the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness? Do you see the implications? The implications is the Bible is based on a certain operating system. And that operating system is that God is the creator and that God made all things. And that that in a very recent past, the Bible, if you read it, if you read it like it's supposed to be read, like a child, remember the children, the, the poor received him gladly. Why? Because the Bible is simple. You don't need to have 47 degrees and 50 years of learning to understand it. Even a child can understand it. If you just open it up, it says in the beginning, everything began again here. God did it all. He made everything. And that first human being is right there on the sixth day. The sixth day. I mean, right there at the beginning. The sixth day of the age of the universe. Wow. And that is recent. Do you know why people want to push the universe out 12, 20 billion years? Because if you can push that out, then you can push the judgment in the end way out there too, so it's far away. You don't have to worry about it. But if you have a relatively recent beginning, you might have a soon ending. And people don't like the implications of that, that the creator gets so close that it's within a few thousand years, then the judge might be close within a few hundred years or less. And that kind of makes people claustrophobic or maybe judgment phobic. I don't know what. But they don't like, and it comes in like this, but that's the operating system of the Bible. Okay, enough of that. Let's look at another implication. Go back to Matthew 24. Okay, that's just one implication that you should think about. Number two, as we go back to Matthew 24, that's the first gospel, the 24th chapter, we next see that Jesus believed that the Bible contained trustworthy and reliable history. Not just science, not just the origins and and how the operating system of the universe began and, and how he tuned it, but secondly, history. In Matthew 24, look at verse 37. It, this we covered way back last year, but look at verse 37. Look how Jesus says this. Jesus says that Genesis, not only 1 through 5, science, but 6 through 8, history, is a literal account of a global flood that destroyed all humans and all land animals that were not aboard the ark. That was what Jesus believed. 
I mean, you can't believe that and hardly even teach science nowadays, but that's what Jesus believed. Remember I said he wouldn't be welcome to teach Sunday school in most churches. He certainly wouldn't be welcome to teach history in any university because he believes crazy things according to people that don't know history. But look at verse 37. But as the days of Noah, so right away Jesus is talking about something like like Genesis is recording history. Okay, verse 37, like the days of Noah were, so it will also be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 38, for as in the days before the flood. Now again, Jesus is talking like this account of what was going on recorded in Genesis is history. Like, like he's basing his, his whole explanation on, on a historic record. So in verse 38, he continues, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. So Noah in the ark is not a metaphor. It's not a, a, an allegory. It's not an analogy. It was an event. Because Jesus has already said the days of Noah, verse 37, verse 38, the days before the flood. And then he says at the end of verse 38, the day that Noah entered the ark. He's tracking a historic account, which we know as Genesis 6, 7, and 8. Hmm. Now verse 39. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So this is Christ confirming the complete global destructive nature of the flood. You understand that Jesus, four times in this little section, describes the Genesis 6, 7, and 8 as if it was a, an actual on-site historic account of an event that took place. And, and the event in Genesis says that it covered the whole earth, every mountain, every inch of the earth was covered with water. It was above every land area. There was complete water entombment of the earth, except for one bobbing, you know, little wooden barge with Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives and all the land, air-breathing animals. Wow. Well, let's ponder the implications of Christ's conviction about history. Because to fast forward to a current issue facing churches around the world, think of human sexuality and morality for a moment. When Jesus, in Matthew 24, verified the absolutely trustworthy historical record of all of Genesis, that means Jesus also believed that Genesis 18 and 19 are true. I mean, if you have trouble with Genesis 6 through 8, I bet you really have trouble with 18 and 19. Do you know what are in there? Sodom and Gomorrah. And what's amazing is Jesus affirmed the deviant behavior of the Sodomites. Those were the inhabitants of the city of Sodom who were involved in homosexuality. And God says that is abhorrent and deviant. God says that's sinful in my sight. And those who practice never repenting of it face God's eternal judgment. Okay, now let's turn to Romans 1, because a lot of times people say, well, that's the God of the Old Testament, he's angry. Let's see what the God of the New Testament says, who, by the way, are the same, right? The God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ, and the God of the New Testament is Jesus Christ, and he is the co-eternal, co-equal, co-substantial member of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are one. Here O Israel, the Lord our God is one. There are not three. There are three persons, but there's only one God. We don't have three gods. We are not tritheistic. We are monotheistic. There is one God eternally existing in three persons. Now, St. Augustine says, don't think about it too much or you'll go crazy because it's impossible to comprehend, but it's true. Okay, but let's think about Romans 1, what it tells us. Any historical account that deviates from God's word is inaccurate. God has written down a history of the world from day one to the present to the last day, and only God will give us the right perspective on history. Look at verse 24 of Romans 1. This is the decline and fall of man. We've heard of the ascent of man, you know, kind of the Darwinian thing. Well, actually, man declined from creation was downhill because man started perfect, and with all knowledge, Adam named all the animals and the species, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But look at the decline and fall of mankind in Romans 1, starting in verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Remember, our body is an expression 
of our response to God. Don't ever think, don't ever forget that. The Lord says we're going to be judged for what we do in our body, what you do with your body. The, the, the lust that, that you feed in the body and the things that dr- are driven from within that we do with our body, we're going to stand and answer to the Lord for that. In fact, the Lord says specifically that, that all other sins are outside the body, but sexual sins affect our body directly. Paul said that. So he said, be very cautious what you do with this body. So God is allowing them, verse 24, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. A lot of people say, oh, it really doesn't matter. Well, it does matter to God because he's going to put this body back together. And in my flesh, Job said, I'm going to stand before God. So all the people that live like the devil, and then they, like Hitler, you know, they shoot themselves and have their body burned because they don't want anybody to reassemble them. Don't worry, God's God's got the code. He's going to put you back together. And in your flesh, and in my flesh, I'm going to face him. And the key is whether or not when we stand before him, we're still covered with our sins or not. But look at the next verse, verse 25. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use of, for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting. So, think of the implications of Christ's view of history. Any view of marriage, morality, or ordination that ignores God's clear statements that homosexuality is against the order and plan of God, those views are false. God's word says that any form of homosexuality, you notice it has in verse 26 both, verse 26, lesbianism, and verse 27, homosexuality. Both are wrong. That means that the, the complete, constant drumbeat of homosexuality, male and female, in television, in movies, I was having the, the proverbial discussion last night. You've all heard of the, um, the dog poo-poo and the brownie story, you know, about the family that wouldn't let their kids watch certain movies because they had bad parts in them. And the kids said, why, Dad? It's only a little evil. So the dad went out on the curve and got a little, little plastic bag and picked up a little, you know, so that the dogs left. And he took a little piece and he put it in the brownie pan when it was still wet and then baked it in the oven and then cut the brownies without the kids knowing and put them on the plate and they're all warm and fresh and chocolate and they all grabbed one. He said, just a second before you eat it. He said, there's only a little bit of dog poo-poo in the brownies. (laughs) Just a little. And I didn't mix it throughout. It's just in one brownie somewhere. But go ahead and eat it because it's just a little. Right? You've all heard that story. And, and, And so my children said, well, what do you mean, Dad? And I said, well, you know, the older you get and the more of these movies that you go to, the constant themes are you 95% of the time, any sexual relations are not between married people. So it's constant fornication, adultery. And, and it's, it's more and more and more of the young people movies have girls kissing girls, boys kissing boys. And it's just this constant frat house wickedness. Any view of life, of marriage, of morality in the church of ordination that ignores God's clear statement that that homosexuality and all other sexual promiscuity is against his order and plan. Those are false views, and God's word says that any form of sexual immorality, including homosexuality and lesbianism, is deviant, sinful, contrary to his will, and faces his eternal wrath. We should be children when it comes to sin. That means we should not know so much about sin that it doesn't repulse us and it doesn't cause us to flee away. If you watch something long enough, you get comfortable with it. If you watch 
fornication long enough, it doesn't shock you. If you watch adultery long enough, it doesn't shock you. If you watch homosexuality long enough, it doesn't offend you. If you watch any form of lesbianism long enough, it doesn't offend you. If you watch the occult long enough, it doesn't offend you. God says we should consider the implications of what Christ's view of history well, one last one before we go this morning. And of course, there are more, but not for this morning. Let's, let's go to, uh, since we're in Romans, let's back up to Zechariah 12. Oh, there is a book we haven't been to for a while. Zechariah. It goes, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew. There you go. So go back from Matthew, uh, a short book, and then go to Zechariah 12. And uh, this is the third of four implications, and we'll pick up on the fourth implication next week, which is Christ's view of salvation. But I would like to talk to you about the implications of Christ's views and convictions about prophecy. Listen to this. Jesus believed the Bible is prophetic and that the Bible contains a roadmap of the entire history of the universe from beginning to end. So the ending that Jesus shared that we've been studying in Matthew 24, that ending and the record in Revelation of Revelation 4 through 22, Jesus affirmed that that was true prophetic roadmap for the future. Now, in Zechariah, in just a minute, we're going to look at Zechariah 12, the first three verses. Any ideas about a world without the Jewish nation and without the Jewish people called Israel are not ideas from God, but ideas from the devil. Do you know who wants to get rid of Israel? Most? Not the Arabs. Not the Muslims. It's the devil. Why? Because God's already written history. And in history, the end of the world is precipitated by Jewish people living in a city called Jerusalem, in a land called Judea, Israel. And all the world is so upset, they're all marching on them. That's how the world ends. And so if you are, are wanting to ruin God's plan, get rid of the Jews. Ship them to Angola, as the United Nations says. Move to Africa. Why do you want to be there over in, by the oil country? Just move to Africa. Well, why are they there? Because that's the land. God said, the, the land that I've put my name on, my ownership on, is that little strip, that land bridge between Europe and Asia and Africa. And that little strip of land that was Canaan, I gave to my servant Abraham. And it is forever to be to his descendants. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, named by God Israel. Forever theirs. So, any group that is opposed to the Jews having the land that God gave them are actually in opposition to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But further, any church that teaches Israel has been replaced by the church does not accurately reflect the teaching of God's word. And that church has allowed a false doctrine, one that, by the way, favors Satan's plan to seep into their theology. In fact, you want to know the most notable person that did that? His name was Martin Luther. I mean, I love him. Can't wait to meet him in heaven. He was totally wrong on that one point. Martin Luther said, the church replaces Israel. The Jews are useless. They're Christ killers. Kill them. Read it. He wrote it. He wrote the address to the German nobility. A young man by the name of Adolf Hitler read that pamphlet and decided he would do it. You see, that is not God's plan. God says, as we'll see in a moment in Zechariah, it is clear for anyone who will read God's word that the Jewish people living in unbelief are rescued nationally by their Messiah, Jesus Christ. And in that moment, some will turn in faith and actually be rescued spiritually and be saved. The short story is that there are Jews in Jerusalem and they're the trigger for the end of the world according to the word of God. That's how God said the world ends. Zechariah 12, starting in verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord. Now who is talking here? Who stretches out the heavens? Who lays the foundations of the earth? Who forms the spirit of man within him? In other words, he's the creator, sustainer, God. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of of drunkenness to all the surrounding people when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen 
in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. Now, there's just you want some little thoughts in here? At the end, it's called Jerusalem and Judah. Judah. That's a very specific geographic place. You know, I really think that all this stuff is going to happen, this giving away the West Bank. I believe that Israel is going to get down and reduced down to probably the region of Judah, which is the part that the whole world kind of accepts them to have. But it's still not going to be enough, and the Muslims are still going to be screaming. And so look what's going to continue to happen. Verse 3, And it will happen in that day, it's future, that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone. Now it goes beyond the surrounding people. Look what it says in verse 3, For all peoples. Remember, God doesn't exaggerate. We're prone to exaggerate. You know, we love to maximize some parts of the story and minimize others, and we love to always, you know, exaggerate and spin. God doesn't spin, okay? When he says all, he means all. So it's going to happen in that day that Jerusalem will be a heavy stone for all peoples, and all would heave it away and surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. All nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zip down to verse 9. And it shall be in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So the world ends with Jerusalem inhabited by Jewish people in this area of Judah that the whole world is opposed to and the whole world is converging on and all the nations that come against Jerusalem, God says, I will seek to destroy. You ever heard of Armageddon? Armageddon is is Jesus on the way to rescuing Jerusalem, and on the way he wipes out all the armies of the world up there. And he goes on to the city of Jerusalem, and look what he does there in verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. These are these are literal descendants, Jewish people. This is not the church. There's no way you can push in Christians into this. This is the house of David. This is on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will pour out the spirit of grace and supplication. Verse 10 continues. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieves as for a firstborn. You know what the Bible says? It says there's going to be a a wonderful conversion of a group of people in Jerusalem as all the armies are coming in and as they're starting to destroy them, it says actually two-thirds of them will be destroyed and one-third will be remaining. And it's kind of the final holocaust. All the Jews are in one place and finally Satan's dream is taking place. And just as two-thirds of them are gone, one-third of them in that moment look up. And as they look up, breaking through the clouds is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And all of a sudden, it connects. And they say, that's Jesus that our forefathers crucified. You are the Messiah. And as they drop to their knees, you read the rest, it's really gross. The Lord makes all the armies, their eyes melt in their sockets, their tongues melt in their mouths. It's like a neutron bomb. And everyone that's opposing Israel is destroyed in an instant. And you can read the rest of the story. It starts in Revelation chapter 20. Jesus believed prophecy. Jesus believed history. Jesus believed science as presented in the Bible. What's the last one? Jesus believed that the Bible presented the only authentic message of salvation. And just like science has gone awry, and history has been rewritten, and just like prophecy is ignored, in most of the 330,000 churches in America, there's great confusion of what salvation really is about. That's why Jesus said, at the end, the majority of the Christian world will not truly be saved. Have you read that? At the last days, most people who call themselves Christians aren't. That's Matthew 7. You ought to read it. It's very chilling. It's Jesus' account of the end and how few there are who have truly embraced Christ. What are the implications of Christ's conviction in Scripture? They're very sobering. should change your view of science. should change your view of history. should change your view of prophecy. And we should change it 
to what Jesus believed. But let's bow before the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you, Lord Jesus, had a high view of scriptures. And I thank you that your convictions should have an impact on us. And the implications of your convictions are that we should be sure our scientific parameters agree with yours. And our historic understanding of the human history of this planet squares with yours. And that our view of the future and prophetic scriptures squares with yours. And then that will help us to make sure that the most important piece is in place, and that is that our view of salvation is correct. And we will not hear the four most horrible words in the universe that you said you will say, I never knew you. O Lord, save us from anyone under the sound of the gospel that would ever hear you say those horrible words to them at the judgment day. Thank you. Bless us in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Amen.